plea for peace. What bishops from Europe are saying about the continuing war in Ukraine. Abortion in America. The issue remains front and center at the White House and on the campaign trail. Eye on North Korea. Japan's government responds amid threats from Pyongyang. And warning from YouTube. Analysis of the social media giant's move regarding pro-life content. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this Feast of St. Luke. I'm Tracy Sable. Catholic bishops in Europe appeal for peace in Ukraine. The call came during a meeting of church leaders late last week in Belgium. There were other items on the agenda for the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union, also known as COMECHE. But the main statement was a call for leaders on both sides of the war in Ukraine to come together to find a peaceful solution. We go now to Bishop Franz Josef Overbeck, Vice President of Komeche and the Bishop of the Diocese of Essen. Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Can you tell us more about this assembly, who was in attendance, and also what was said, uh, especially about the continuing war in Ukraine? Yes, well, the Commission um, is an assembly of all those bishops um, who have an interest in the European Union. So we assemble normally as in Brussels or in Strasbourg, and sometimes as Catholic also in Rome. Uh, and I'm elected vice president, one of four who represent the fourth part of the uh, European Union. And the last time we have been assembled has been uh, last week in Brussels. And we are looking on the EU in the context of the war and of the pandemic, because the last two, nearly three years, where, um, where we are very busy with, with the pandemic and now actually from the 24th of February on with the Ukrainian-Russian war. In addition to the brutal war in the uh, Ukraine, it offers effects uh, also particularly pressing. So by this I mean, for example, the high prices even for essential goods here, not only in Germany, but in all the European countries affected by the war, uh, uh, may be also particularly um, um, dangerous for the social peace in our countries. Uh, looking by this, uh, I mean, um, it is regarding um, energy, regarding food for us, um, actually so many more exp expensive than the last years that the danger is existing that many people are asking themselves how they can li live in, in, in the normal day life. And Your Excellency, I, I understand um, at the end of the meeting, uh, the bishops released a statement about the war. Can you tell us more about that and why that was so important? Because of the really incredibly great suffering that is being brought upon the people. And I, as a German bishop here in the western part of Germany, uh, can see that by all the refugees and um, people coming from the Ukrainian uh, state here up to us for living here with us. We have just experienced uh, the very difficult uh, way of the refugees coming from Syria and Iraq in 2015. Actually, up to now, from the 24th of February, more people has reached Germany and also our region here, where I am bishop, than in all the years before. And so, also this statement is a sign of solidarity with them, but also with, him, with the possibility to live together with people who have the right to live in peace and also with all the good they have to have for live in peace together with the whole family. And I think to get that together, we have to have been very conscious that the madness of this war is incredible. And to serve hope, to live in a better situation in the next years means to put all these forces together to reach this aim. 
Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about all of this. We really do appreciate it. Uh, God bless you. Yes, God bless you all. And also you in your stage with all the problems we have together with <laughs> and to deal with. All the best to you. God bless you. Thanks a lot. A Catholic bishop in Spain says the country's government is calling pro-lifers, quote, ultra-Catholic or on the extreme right. The archbishop says personal attacks are a last resort for those who know they are going against God. In recent months, Spain's socialist government has issued fines against several pro-life organizations. Meantime, in southern England, a town there has made it illegal to make the sign of the cross in public areas around an abortion clinic. The town council also made it illegal to recite scripture or sprinkle holy water near the abortion provider. Those caught doing so face a fine or risk a court conviction. Well, here in the United States, President Joe Biden joined Democrats today pushing the administration's abortion agenda. The elections are just three weeks from today, and the White House is trying to energize voters. Pro-life groups, however, have a very different message. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Hi, Tracy, and good evening to you. This afternoon, President Joe Biden met with Democrats to lay out his proposal. The very first bill the president wants Congress to pass next year is one that would restore Roe v. Wade, that is, to codify it. Now, Republicans who defend life stand ready to block him. President Joe Biden headlines a Restore Roe event at the Howard Theater in Washington, D.C., surrounded by supportive Democrats. The court got Roe right nearly 50 years ago, and I believe Congress should codify Roe once and for all. The president has no control over Congress, but he insists lawmakers take up the issue. He wants Roe v. Wade struck down in June by the Supreme Court restored through legislation. The only sure way to stop these extremist laws that are put in jeopardy women's health and rights is for Congress to pass a law. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to California for a conversation with Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider. There was a movement that was started generations ago that culminated in Roe v. Wade. We are now the ones that are responsible for picking up that movement. Republicans push back, writing, bringing in the radical abortion lobby at the 11th hour won't bail Democrats out this November. Americans know single-party Democrat rule is the reason that inflation is at a 40-year high, crime is out of control, and the southern border is wide open. And pro-life groups like Live Action offer an alternative, Definitely. tweeting videos promoting life from women who regretted their abortions. When something is ripped from you, it leaves a hole. Also tonight, Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, says the stakes of the midterm elections could not be higher because President Biden made it clear today Democrats want to destroy the Senate filibuster so they can mandate abortion on demand in all 50 states. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Abortion also was the main topic in the debate last night in the race for governor of Georgia. Republican Brian Kemp says if reelected, he will not pursue any new restrictions on abortion. Democrat challenger Stacey Abrams calls the governor, quote, an extremist on abortion. Georgia currently bans nearly all abortions at six weeks, a measure Governor Kemp supported. All Senate candidates in Ohio also battled over abortion last night. Republican J.D. Vance says that he is pro-life, but says he believes in some exceptions. Democrat Tim Ryan, a 10-term member of Congress, calls the overturning of Roe versus Wade, quote, government overreach. He also says that he does not support a measure that would ban abortion after six weeks. Well, staying in Ohio, Republican Congressman Brad Wenstrup has represented the state's second district since 2012. This fall, he is facing Democrat Samantha Meadows, a political newcomer who previously worked in a pediatric clinic. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has more on the race. I'm near Cincinnati, Ohio, in the state's 2nd Congressional District, where Catholic Congressman Brad Winstrip hopes to keep his seat come November. I sat down with him to find out why he wants to continue his work on Capitol Hill. And as we look at things, we got to ask ourselves, are the works that we are doing, are they making, is it making Americans more free? And will the next generation say thank you for what we're doing? And right now, we're, we're not seeing a lot of that as we would like to. The former colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve served during the Iraq War as a physician and surgeon. Congressman Winstrup tells me he's pro-life. 
That's why he became a doctor. How can you not look at that child in the womb and not understand to some degree that's its own unique life that if it's aborted never gets a chance to play out never gets a chance to do so many wonderful things he adds democrats are out of touch on pro-life issues people say follow the science when it's convenient for them but they don't seem to want to follow the science look when you have that child in your womb that is a distinctly unique human being Congressman Winstrip tells me he's excited what the future holds if Republicans take control of the U.S. House. With the commitment to America, what we're really highlighting is that we want an America where people feel safe and secure in their homes. You've seen the Democrats talking about defunding police and really stripping down law and order, letting people walk right out of jail that have committed crimes. That's not what we are about. It's anticipated that Republicans will in fact take the House. What issue would you like to see tackled first? As a physician, I'm very much involved with what we've worked up in the commitment to America on health care. Uh, that's uh, one of the big things that I have been working on directly. But, you know, again, it's security. We want an accountable government. We want more freedom for America, make sure that Americans are still free and a strong economy. Serving on the Healthy Future Task Force, Congressman Winstrup says he will advocate for innovative solutions to health care access and new therapies and cures. We want to focus on people's health span. How do we keep people healthier longer? Not just their lifespan, because we can keep people alive for a long time, but how we keep them healthier longer. How much we can do in preventive medicine and, and incentivize preventive medicine, not only to physicians, but also to patients. It's important to note I did reach out to Winstrup's opponent, Democrat Samantha Meadows. However, my emails were never returned. Near Cincinnati, Ohio, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, with marijuana initiatives on the ballot in five states, what Catholic leaders are reminding the faithful. All five U.S. states are set to consider measures next month that would legalize marijuana. Voters in Arkansas, Maryland, Missouri, North Dakota, and South Dakota will decide whether recreational marijuana use should be legalized. And church leaders in several of those states are weighing in. We go now to Jonah McEwen, staff writer and podcast producer for Catholic News Agency, who has been following this story. Jonah, great to have you on. So what are church leaders in the states in question saying about the measure? Yeah, Tracy, the Catholic bishops in almost all of the states that you mentioned uh, here in Missouri, Maryland, Arkansas, and North and South Dakota have released statements to the faithful, just reminding them about the church's teaching on drugs. Now, the church doesn't have a specific teaching on marijuana that, you know, that it's inherently sinful or anything like that. But in terms of, of you know, the abuse of drugs, apart from any kind of therapeutic use, the church does teach that that the use of drugs for anything other than therape therapeutic reasons is is sinful. And so that's something that the bishops, uh, you know, for example, here in Missouri, wanted to remind the faithful is that um, this is not something that Catholics should be supporting, the, legal, the legalization of marijuana. Yeah, and I know that some bishops even cited, you know, health issues that are connected to regular use of marijuana. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, that's right. Many of the, the arguments put forth by the bishops were, were very practical and supported by evidence and science. Um, for, for example, um, some of the evidence that was cited comes from Colorado, which is where I lived for about four years until recently, and they've seen uh, demonstrably higher teen usage rates of marijuana in Colorado, higher you know rates of traffic accidents, and just uh, other uh, other health effects that are, are not good and, and not, and um, according to the bishops, should not be supported by Catholics. Yeah, and I also know uh, in your recent article for Catholic News Agency, you even noted that Pope Francis has weighed in on the partial legalization of drugs. What exactly did the Holy Father say? Yeah, that's right. Pope Francis weighed in in 2014 at an address in the, at, at the Vatican, where he basically said the solution to the usage of drugs is not more drugs. He cautioned against any kind of legalization, even of, of so-called recreational drugs like marijuana. And he, he, he cautioned that this is not 
this is not the way to solve the problems that are associated with with drugs. Uh, we should be addressing the underlying issues instead and not legalizing these substances. Yeah, and Jenna, I'm curious, um, is there any way to predict, you know, how voters may turn out on this issue or poll numbers or anything like that that gives us a sense uh, of whether these measures will pass? That's a really good question. And indications seem to suggest that these are, are winning issues. I, I mean, uh, 20 states or excuse me, 19 states and the District of Columbia have already um, legalized recreational marijuana. And that kind of runs the gamut of, you know, quote unquote, red states versus blue states. It, it's kind of, in a sense, a winning issue everywhere. And polling does suggest that these these ballot measures in each of these five states are quite likely to pass. All right. And before I let you go, Jonah, uh, quickly, what other stories maybe are you following on your radar or anything that you're working on that you think would be of interest to our viewers? Yeah, with, with the midterm elections coming up, as your viewers probably know, many states have ballot initiatives that could enshrine abortion into their laws, which, of course, following the overturn of Roe v. Wade, um, you know, that's something that states have been doing. Some states have been legislating in a pro-life direction, others in, in a pro-abortion direction. And so th there's at least five states that have abortion on the ballot. So I'd really recommend people follow, uh, you know, our work at EWTN and Catholic News Agency just to keep abreast of, of these ballot initiatives in um, in in these five states that have to do with abortion. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Jonah, great to be with you today. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this with us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Well, a new report says the U.S. Department of Justice is set to charge yet another pro-lifer. The Daily Signal reports a 25-year-old pro-lifer is set to be charged with violations of the FACE Act stemming from an incident back in 2020 in Washington, D.C. He was one of several pro-lifers in attendance that day. Each is expecting to be arrested soon and could face up to 11 years in prison. A gunman attacked a church in north central Nigeria, killing a woman and her young daughter. Government officials say no arrests have been made just yet. In Nigeria, this year alone, at least seven attacks have happened at churches or mosques. While a Catholic priest was detained last week in the capital of Nicaragua, he is the latest clergy member to be arrested under the government of Daniel Ortega. On Twitter, an exiled priest in the country is calling on an end to the persecution of the church there. Well, Japan announces more sanctions against North Korea. Well, Tokyo is freezing the assets of five organizations that it said were involved in nuclear and missile development. In recent weeks, North Korea has launched a series of tests, including a ballistic missile that flew over Japan. Up next, how a case at the Supreme Court could impact social media and big tech. Well, as we reported last week, social media giant YouTube has added a warning to content from many Catholic and pro-life organizations. The labels appear beneath the video with a link to so-called abortion health information. The warning even appears on some videos of Pope Francis. We go now to Rachel Bombard, senior tech columnist at The Federalist and policy director at the Conservative Partnership. Rachel, welcome back. Always great to be with you. So tell us more about these warnings. Why is YouTube doing this? And what effect do you think it's having? I understand it's even uh, placing abortion information on videos about vandalism that happened at pro-life pregnancy centers. Yeah, YouTube, which is owned by Google, is doing this under the guise of promoting uh, informational services about abortion because it seems that anything, any content that goes against, um, you know, the abortion position, meaning that abortion should be a right, might fall under the category of misinformation, according to YouTube. So they claim they are simply providing information to the viewers, but obviously it does feel a little bit like, or a lot like, uh, YouTube's asserting its own opinion that, you know, some of this content about pro-life positioning may be, in fact, misinformation, which uh, is offensive to a number of, of constituencies, Catholics and myself included. Yeah, indeed. And, and Rachel, you know, what so-called abortion information are they providing? 
So they are providing a number of things. It depends where you are on Google's website, but they're providing uh, what they say is neutral information about what an abortion is, where you can access it, um, and how the procedure is done. So they're trying to say, you know, we want to come back, quote unquote, misinformation about what the procedure is. But in reality, it looks like, frankly, they're advertising for the abortion industry uh, and doing making an in-kind donation uh, effectively uh, to that industry, which, again, kind of goes counter to the idea that all views should be shared equally on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to switch gears now. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, as you know, is set to hear two cases on Section 230 and big tech. If you don't mind, can you talk about those cases, uh, why they're so important, and ultimately how you see this playing out? So this is a pretty big deal in the sense that this is the first uh, time the Supreme Court has taken up a look at Section 230. And for those unfamiliar, Section 230 is this provision of law that grants sweeping immunity to the tech companies for any liability for content posted by the users. Now, over time, as I've argued in, in several venues and others have as well, this immunity has been stretched uh, to cover all, all activities by the platform. So what we were just talking about, the fact checks they provide, um, how they rank content, uh, that is all covered by Section 230. And the question is, should it be? And the case before the court specifically, um, it's two cases, but the prominent case called Gonzalez v. Google deals with whether or not the platform should be able to amplify content algorithmically. So the, specific, the specifics of this case deal with the um, filed by the family of an American who was actually killed in Paris in an ISIS terrorist attack. And the family claims that Google, which owns YouTube, played a role in that by placing ISIS content algorithmically into the attacker's feed. So the attacker wasn't looking for it. The algorithm promoted it. And so this case has to do with does Section 230 cover, meaning does it make immune from liability, the platform's role in algorithmically amplifying this content? And so that's going to be the question the court hears. Now, I think this could go one of two ways. Um, a very narrow decision, could the court could say, well, Section 230 covers all these things except for content related to terrorism. Or they could take a very broad ruling and say, well, ever, either you know a very sweeping ruling and say everything is covered by Section 230 or nothing is covered by Section 230. There's not a lot of, you know, the Supreme Court hasn't weighed in that much on this question previously, except for Justice Clarence Thomas, who's opined on it. He's been saying, look, we should rein in or review this law. But it's kind of unknown where the rest of the justices are going to fall on this. So um, there's another case potentially coming before the court, Net, uh, Net Choice v. Paxton, which has to do with the Texas social media law, which could present an even broader question on Section 230. So this we may not see the end of it just with this case. Yeah, Rachel, we have probably about a minute left or so, but I quickly want to touch on this. Um, the controversial rapper Kanye West, who now goes by the name Ye, uh, as you probably know, has agreed to buy the social media platform Parler. This as the deadline draws near for Elon Musk and Twitter to reach a deal. I want to get your thoughts on all this, and how do you think that this will impact big tech and free speech? So my concern with alternative platforms is this. I think they're great and should be pursued. But the problem is, if you are a social media app, you only have two access points to the market, through the Apple App Store or the, through the Google App Store. And we famously saw how that impacted Parler uh, back in 2020 when Apple kicked them out, Google kicked them out, Amazon web hosting services refused to host them. They basically were shut down as a small business. So until that distribution monopolies addressed, it's going to be very hard for these alternative services to succeed. We're even seeing this with Truth Social. Um, so I'm pro, you know, as many, let many flowers bloom, as they say, but I think we have to address the constraints in the market for them to ultimately be successful. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on and weighing in. We always appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.